So uh, welcome to uh, Urology Grand Rounds. Uh, we are going to be having two speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Alex Bandon, who's going to be talking about pheochromocytoma and the adrenal incidentaloma, uh, followed by uh, Jack Agney, who is our sub-intern from Yale, who's going to be talking about advances in the surgical management. Uh, morning, everybody. So I wanted to take this opportunity to present an interesting, rare case that we had over at the VA. Uh, as well as some kind of key points that I think are really important for general practice as well as the boards. So to jump into uh, the presentation, I'll go over a case presentation. I wanted to go over the adrenal incidentaloma workup um, as well as pheochromocytoma, which is, the, which is our case. So to start with, uh, a case is a 74-year-old African-American gentleman who had not really gotten any medical care for about 15 years. Uh, he showed up in his primary care office to establish care uh, with a blood pressure of 210 over 104. His creatinine was 1.8. Last time he'd been seen in the hospital was 15 years prior. Uh, he, um, over the course of the next couple of months, the primary care doctor started him on amlodipine and lisinopril and then got a screening ultrasound just because he was a new diagnosis of CKD. Uh, and the renal ultrasound demonstrated that there was a four centimeter mass either in the right upper pole versus in the right adrenal gland. Um, and I'll go over the follow up CAT scan. Um, but, you know, in terms of this gentleman's past medical history, like I said, not, wasn't really established with care. He was intermittently on antihypertensives for the past 15 or 20 years, um, intermittently on and off medication for ED and had never had any surgery. So, uh, this was his um, CT scan that was obtained to follow up his ultrasound images, which demonstrated a four and a half centimeter mass in the right adrenal gland abutting the renal vasculature as well as the IVC. Uh, he had follow up scans with, uh, and oh, how do I get out of here? All right. He had a follow up MRI of, of the lesion, which I just did in a different view for us to better visualize. He had some simple cysts in the kidneys and this partially cystic, partially solid mass in the right adrenal gland, again, kind of abutting the renal vasculature and the IVC. Uh, he also had a uh, PET scan, which demonstrated avidity only in the right adrenal gland um, and no evidence of any metastatic disease. So uh, for his adrenal mass, he got a metabolic workup. Um, his labs to evaluate pheochromocytoma showed elevated plasma and urine, metanephrines, normetanephrines. Um, his cortisol workup, his dexamethasone suppression test was within normal range, and his aldosterone workup for high uh, aldosterone secretion also had a normal serum aldosterone to renin ratio. And I'm going to go into this a lot more later in the presentation um, as I go over the incidental loma workup. So in terms of his pre-op, the patient was started on alpha blockade with doxazosin, um, which was initially started at a low dose and up titrated over the course of the subsequent couple of months. Um, as he got into the four to eight milligram uh, doxazosin uh, alpha blockade, he started to get some baseline tachycardia. So he was started on metoprolol to help control the tachycardia. Um, his antihypertensives that he had been on before were titrated um, before, and the patient was instructed to hydrate orally and increase the salt content of his diet um, as prehydration for his uh, for his surgery. He wound up on this regimen for a while between. Uh, COVID and get and him winding up going to endocrine surgery at Yale and then his endocrine surgeon wasn't able to do the surgery and then he came back to us so he was actually kind of he was on blockade for a couple of months before his surgery um, and you know stable blood pressures and stable heart rate so uh, we saw him at the VA late July for a planned right robotic adrenalectomy the patient was also consented for a possible open surgery possible right nephrectomy given the masses proximity to the renal vasculature. So we began the case by mobilizing liver, liver and retracting it caudally, or sorry, retracting it cranially. Um, the colon duodenum were reflected medially, and actually it was very nice. The adrenal gland was right there. The adrenal vein was pretty anterior, easily identified and ligated. Uh, there was no invasion of the IVC or renal vasculature. The mass was able to be pretty easily peeled away from, the, from those structures. Uh, anesthesia had to start the patient on a nitroprusside drip because he was becoming intermittently very hypertensive during dissection of the gland. Um, but once the gland was fully removed, 
the patient actually became uh, developed significant hypotension and was started on a phenylephrine drip. Um, he did have um, otherwise procedure was relatively uncomplicated. There's a small capsular tear in the liver that we controlled with the argon beam. Overall, it was about a 200 cc EBL procedure, and the patient got two and a half liters of crystalloid during the case. Uh, Postoperatively, he did very well. Um, you know, he was off pressors within about eight hours of coming out of the operating room, and actually a few hours after that, started to be hypertensive. So he was started on a very low dose of amlodipine, which was what he was on preoperatively. Uh, his major issue postoperatively actually wound up being a persistent oxygen requirement. Um, we you know, really thought was due to abdominal pain. The patient wasn't taking deep breaths. He was, you know, kind of doing okay in terms of ambulation. He was on two liters nasal cannula until about post up day four when we were finally able to wean him and chest imaging that was unrevealing. Uh, he went home on post up day five. He did wind up having to restart his, um, you know, lower doses of uh, antihypertensive medications. Um, and we just did a telephone visit with him about a week and a half ago. Um, and he's doing very well, recovering very well after surgery. So um, I thought this was a good case to go over. I think two things that are important, again, one for the boards and two for our general practice. I think the first one is the adrenal incidentaloma, which is a workup that can be a little bit intimidating. And you know, uh, these patients will often get referred to endocrine, uh, endocrinology for assistance with this adrenal incidentaloma workup, which endocrinology is often going to be sending the patients along if they wind up needing surgery to endocrine surgery. So this is a really this is a really great case, and if we are interested in doing more of these, uh, this workup is actually not as intimidating as it seemed when I was first starting to see it. Uh, so, in terms of the adrenal incidentaloma, actually fairly common. There were you know series you know in abdominal imaging series, it can be seen some you know one two percent of certain abdominal imaging series, and for adrenal incidentalomas, the Camels actually quotes that about twenty percent of these lesions are potentially operable lesions. Uh, so this is actually, you know, a case that could be getting done much more often. So in terms of lesions that are potentially operative, there's about 11% of adrenal incidentalomas are going to be found to be metabolically active. So either cortisol producing, aldosterone producing, or pheochromocytoma. Um, they may be a malignant adrenal cortical carcinoma. Um, and there is some data the, that oligometastatic disease to adrenal glands, depending on the primary, is also potentially a resectable disease, but that's going to be a minority of what is going to actually be found to be uh, resectable on workup. So in terms of adrenal incidentaloma imaging, uh, so this is one of the few patients that would, you know, would be coming initially with an ultrasound. You know, most, of the, most of the time an adrenal incidentaloma is going to be on cross-sectional imaging, but um, the first thing that you want to do if you have a patient who is initially detected on something like an ultrasound, uh, non-contrast CT is, can be a very good first step um, in a patient with, and if the mass is less than 10 pounds full units, it's adrenal, uh, an adrenal adenoma, and as long as the metabolic workup is negative and the mass is appropriate size, then you're kind of done there. Now, most patients would get an enhanced CT washout study, which you can um, kind of think of like a, the equivalent of a CT urogram, but for the adrenal gland. So that's pre-contrast imaging, contrast imaging, and post, you know, 15 minutes post-contrast imaging. Um, and a lesion that has greater than 60% washout, if it wasn't clearly an adrenal adenoma on the non-contrast phase, that can help you clarify the adrenal adenoma. In terms of the likelihood of malignancy, likelihood of malignancy increases with increasing size. Um, general recommendations are that any lesion greater than four centimeters should be resected due to the risk of malignancy. Um, the risk of a malignant lesion actually decreases with age. The patient, older patients are more likely to have benign adenomas, so you can have a little bit more flexibility in terms of watching them. Um, and for some of the smaller tumors that have a lower risk of malignancy, you can watch them with serial imaging, although there are series that say that if you do watch them and then wind up removing the lesion due to growth rate, the large majority of those re lesions are going to wind up being benign, which is going to be expected because even if you're resecting a lesion per this chart that's four or four and a half centimeters, the large majority of them are going to be benign. In terms of the functional workup, which is an important part of this, uh, NIH recommends that all adrenal incidentaloma, so adrenal lesion greater than one centimeter, should have a metabolic workup. There's three components of the metabolic workup. It's the test for cortisol hypersecretion, uh, catecholamine hypersecretion, and aldosterone hypersecretion. So that's three out of the four main functions of the adrenal glands. 
uh, sex hormone uh, secreting tumors are so vanishingly rare that it's not something that should generally be tested for unless you're very clinically suspicious for that. Um, and the aldosterone hypersecretion actually uh, only needs to be done if the patient has clinical hypertension uh, because those aldosterone secreting tumors are also very rare. So cortisol hypersecretion, this is kind of the most complicated one. So here's our Cushingoid uh, image that we've all seen from, you know, recall from our step one studies in medical school. So Cushingoid patients, they're going to be a metabolic syndrome kind of looking patient. They have peripheral insulin resistance, they're obese, the muscular atrophy. Um, the, these patients are more inclined to have kidney stones, they have hypogonadism. Uh, so these are the things that should be making you suspicious for clinical Cushingoid. So to test for cortisol hypersecretion, there's three first line tests. Um, the late night salivary cortisol test, a low dose dexamethasone suppression test, or a 24 hour urinary free cortisol. The first two are generally recommended on guidelines, um, but there are certain patient populations that are better or worse for certain, uh, one, for certain ones of these, and I'm gonna go over that in just a moment. These tests can be used either together or sequentially to aid in the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome for one of these patients. And if you're getting repeat labs, a lower suppressed ACTH level can also be added on as a way to suggest that the origin of the cortisol is actually from the adrenal gland as opposed to the pituitary. Uh, there we go. So first is the late night salivary cortisol test. This is the about the easiest one. You instruct the patient to swab their mouth between 11 p.m. and midnight. Um, and then usually they'll mail in that swab. Um, the level should not exceed 145 nanograms per deciliter. This is less accurate in patients who have irregular sleep, patients with depression, and smokers. Um, smokers should be instructed to not smoke for several days before doing the late night salivary cortisol test. Low dose dexamethasone suppression test, also pretty straightforward. You give the patient a prescription for one milligram of dexamethasone. You have them take it at 11 p.m. You can have them say, swab your mouth with this swab and then take your one milligram dexamethasone. The following morning, they should come in for a serum cortisol between eight to 9 a.m. And that should suppress to less than 1.8 micrograms per deciliter. Um, this test is not, uh, not valid in the patients who are on oral contraceptives or on several different versions of anti-epileptics because it changes your metabolism for dexamethasone. The last is a 24-hour urinary free cortisol. Uh, same as a 24-hour urine collection in terms of the way that the patients collect it, and four times level of normal is diagnostic of Cushing syndrome. Uh, in pregnant patients, the values are different. The, the amount of cortisol that they put out in the urine is much higher. It's two to three times, depending on where they are in the pregnancy. Um, and this test is less accurate for patients with CKD, again, patients with depression, obese patients, and alcoholic patients. So depending on who your patient is, it will help you guide which one of these screening tests you can use for cortisol hypersecretion. And again, you can also use multiple of these screening tests to help you kind of zero in on the diagnosis. You can add if your screening tests are you know, iffy, if you only have one positive and the other ones are negative, you can do things like a two-day two dexamethasone suppression test to further follow it up. Aldosterone hypersecretion is very rare. Um, this is uh, just done with a morning plasma aldosterone to renin ratio. Also needs to be done around eight or nine o'clock in the morning. So you can have patients get this on the same blood draw when you do the low dose dexamethasone suppression test. Um, if the aldosterone to renin ratio is greater than 20 and the aldosterone uh, concentration is greater than 15, that is a positive screening test. This does need confirmatory tests before you would say take a patient to the operating room. And those confirmatory tests are actually pretty involved. They're, they involve multi-day sodium loads or saline boluses over a couple of days, multi-day steroid regimens. So it, Campbell's really suggests that for this, um, for this test, if you have a positive screen, these patients would probably have endocrinology involved um, in the remainder of their workup. And if patients on a potassium sparing diuretic like spironolactone, this test does not work unless they'd stopped it for six weeks before. Catecholamine hypersecretion, uh, this is to test for pheochromocytomas, which account for 5% of all adrenal incidentalomas. So for every 20 adrenal incidentalomas you work up, you should be picking up a pheochromocytoma, even though these are pretty rare tumors. Plasma-free metanephrines and normetanephrines, or 24-hour uh, total urine metanephrine. Uh, so those, those are your screening tests. Either or is acceptable. Uh, you know, different papers suggest that one is better than the other. 
uh, patients should avoid caffeine, Tylenol, and tricyclic antidepressants prior to these studies. So that was a mouthful, but to summarize it, to you know, make this more straightforward. So to summarize your adrenal and ectoloma workup, you have to make sure that you have your appropriate imaging. You test for cortisol hypersecretion, you know, one or two of those tests that we discussed. So a simple late night salivary cortisol swab at the same time they can take de dexamethasone. The following morning, they can get their blood drawn for their cortisol level. They can have their plasma-free metanephrines and normetanephrines on that same blood draw. They can have their morning plasma aldosterone renin ratio on the same blood draw. So you can get this full metabolic workup with a mouth swab, one pill, one blood draw. Um, and you are testing for all three of your hypersecretion. Um, adrenal biopsy is generally only considered useful if you're suspicious of metastatic disease, which in a patient with a prior history of cancer, you should be, because that's one of the most common lesions that you'll have in as the adrenal lesion. Um, but if you're considering an adrenal biopsy, you do need to ensure that you have ruled out a pheochromocytoma, because biopsy of a pheochromocytoma is potentially life-threatening. So that's my spiel on the adrenal incidentaloma. And then I wanted to dive into a little bit more pheochromocytoma because this is not a rare, or this is a rare tumor that we don't see very much of. Uh, and I thought worth kind of going over. So it's rare incidents, one to two per 100,000. Um, like I said, represents about 5% of adrenal incidentalomas. And overall of pheochromocytomas that are detected, about 10 to 25% of them are detected on an incidentaloma workup, uh, not because a patient shows up with your kind of classic symptoms. So this is a tumor of the catecholamine cells of the adrenal, um, the catecholamine secreting cells of the adrenal medulla, that's secretion of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So that leads you to your clinical presentation. So your kind of classic idea of the patient who has episodic hypertension, severe headaches, palpitations, swelling, um, you know, really, really high, high blood pressures when they show up in the emergency room. That's kind of what you classically will think of when you're thinking of a pheochromocytoma patient. But actually, episodic hypertension, like our classic picture, only occurs in about 30 to 50 percent of patients. The remainder of the patients usually are going to have baseline hypertension, like our case at the beginning, and some patients will even be normotensive. You know, traditionally, and kind of, again, going back to our step one, they talk about this being a you know, the 10% tumor where 10% are paraganglioma, 10% are pediatric, 10% are um, in familial cases, but that those numbers have all been revised with more recent data. So really there's actually, you know, 10 to 25% can be extra adrenal. Um, familial cases, now that we have better definitions of the familial syndromes can account for up to a third of pheochromocytomas. And because that's such a high rate, if you have a pheochromocytoma patient who's under age 50, it's generally recommended that you at least discuss genetic screening for patients. On the subject of genetic screening, there's a couple of different familial pheochromocytoma syndromes. So MEN2A, MEN2B uh, are the two big ones that put you at really, really high risk for pheochromocytomas. For us urologists, the one that will really kind of stand out is VHL patients. So a lot of VHL patients are already gonna be following with urologists due to their recurrent RCC tumors. So those patients are at an increased risk for pheochromocytoma. So they should definitely be cl closely watched. And there's the neurofibromatosis patients and the patients who have familial paraganglioma syndrome. So increased risk of pheochromocytoma. And for those familial paraganglioma syndromes, those patients are actually at really increased risk of malignant pheochromocytoma uh, as opposed to a, you know, b a benign or non-metastatic pheochromocytoma, which on that subject, uh, an important part of if you have a diagnosis of pheochromocytoma and you're thinking about resecting, the diagnosis of malignant pheochromocytoma is actually a clinical diagnosis. Pathologically, under a microscope, you can't tell the difference between a malignant pheochromocytoma and a benign pheochromocytoma. It's really based on your preoperative workup and your clinical staging. So patients with pheochromocytoma should be staged with a PET scan to identify possible metastatic disease. Uh, PET scans have been shown to be significantly more sensitive than just a standard CT with contrast for staging. In terms of the perioperative management, uh, there's a couple of kind of pathways. This I got this out of uh, the Campbell's chapter in terms of some more traditional pathways. So your very traditional alpha blockade with phenoxybenzamine that's been used for a long time. Um, you start at 10 milligrams BID and you can increase the dose slowly. You wanna have the patient blocked for probably two weeks uh, preoperatively. 
Um, phenoxybenzamine, although it is the agent of choice historically, it does have a lot of side effects, especially tachycardia and possibly cardiac arrhythmias. So if the patients do develop tachycardia, you can add on beta blockade, as was done with our patient who he didn't get blocked with phenoxybenzamine, he got doxazosin. Um, but if a patient on alpha blockade starts to develop tachycardia, uh, you can add on beta blockade to get them at a better place where you have both the blood pressure controlled as well as the heart rate controlled preoperatively. Uh, metyrosine is pretty uh, provider and institution dependent in terms of its use to actually stop catecholamine synthesis blockade. Um, and then the next line is that you can add calcium channel blockade if you're still having trouble controlling blood pressure despite adequate alpha and beta blockade. There are some centers that don't do alpha blockade um, preoperatively. Generally, that's reserved for patients who are minimally symptomatic or completely asymptomatic. Um, and some, you know, some centers for these minimally or asymptomatic pheochromocytoma patients will just start a calcium channel blocker to control their blood pressure. Our patient got started on alpha blockade with doxazosin. The more selective alpha blockers like doxazosin, terazosin, are also being used um, to initiate patients on alpha blockade. And those are medications that a lot of us urologists are gonna be a little bit more comfortable with the prescribing and the side effects of. And those, and those are totally adequate for, for alpha blockade, like our patient got preoperatively. Um, the other thing for preoperative management for the patients is like our patient was instructed to, these patients are chronically volume down because they have so much tonic vasoconstriction. So you should think of these patients always as being volume depleted. So they should be instructed preoperatively to really try to pick up their volume, increase the salt in their diet, increase the water in their diet um, to help minimize the risk of labile blood pressures perioperatively. Some centers will uh, admit patients preoperatively for a day or two to make sure that their blood pressures are adequately controlled and they're adequately prehydrated as well. And then in terms of your surgical management, it's important to always be in close communication with your anesthesiologist in any case, but especially in this case, because blood pressures can be so labile depending on your active you know, uh, dissection during the surgery. It was, you know, it was like some, when we did this case, it was like something straight out of the, the medical school lecture where as we were doing the dissection on the case, we heard anesthesiology talking about how they're starting the nitroprusside drip. As soon as the tumor came out, well, well we stopped the nitroprusside drip, now he's on pressors. It was, you know, just, exactly kind of your, your classic picture from the anesthesiology perspective. Um, they will intermittently get hypertensive during the case is pretty much expected. They are likely to become severely hypotensive afterwards and postoperatively they may also have significant hypoglycemia. So it's important to keep a close eye on their blood sugars uh, for while they're in house in the hospital. Um, you wanna get them on a good antihypertensive regimen prior to discharge because a lot of these patients are going to have a you know, baseline essential hypertension too that just needs to be adequately managed, especially if they've been living hypertensive for a long time. Um, and then, like I said, uh, when you get your pathology back, you don't really have a diagnosis of whether or not this was a malignant tumor or not. Um, so these patients should all be followed with annual biochemical testing with plasma metanephrines or, and or urine metanephrines and the 10-year recurrence rate for these patients, even if they were considered quote-unquote benign preoperatively, are, is about 16%. So that's, um, that's everything I've got for, uh, for this talk. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, so we have, uh, <clears throat> go on Preston. Yeah, we're just gonna give a few minutes for questions, then, I don't, then we'll go into Jack's talk. Yeah, sorry, I know you need to get to the next talk. So. Thanks, Alex. I think that was a great overview um, of the adrenal of adrenal lesions and sort of the workup. Um, you know, it's something that's pretty straightforward and easy to know. I know it's on the boards periodically. We still are expected to know it. Uh, I think it's also really important to understand that this is teamwork with the endocrine surgeon. We don't see a lot of these now because endocrine surgeons have kind of taken these away from us. Uh, we used to do a ton of adrenal work. Um, and the way to, and these are really fun cases, so the, the way to kind of recover this and bring this back and uh, to us is to really be friendly with the endocrinologist. Let them know that you do these surgeries, let them know that you can do a lot of these surgeries. I mean, quite honestly, I think we're more familiar with the vasculature and the anatomy in that area because we are so often doing kidney surgery. Um, so I think it's very appropriate for us to be doing these surgeries um, 
and uh, that's just a, a, a so I, I would recommend trying to build those relationships with endocrine because we only got this case because the endocrine surgeon left the VA. <laughs> so uh, we were not first line. Fortunately, they now know that we exist and we can do these, but it, it does take a little bit of effort to, uh, to generate that friendship and that relationship with the endocrine team, but I highly recommend it. Alex, I just had a, uh, I thought that was a great talk. I just had a couple comments on the alpha blockade. Um, one of them is about, around volume status. Um, as you mentioned, people are volume deplete because um, of all of the alpha agonism. Um, if someone's adequately alpha blocked prior to surgery, they really shouldn't be volume deplete. Um, and so, um, you know, that's why it's no longer really required to admit people prior to surgery for hydration. Um, so, um, you know, adequate alpha blockade should really eliminate that. As long as someone's adequately alpha blocked, they're gonna they're gonna drink over time, and and you know they don't really need to hydrate ahead of time. One of the other comments is you know, um, you know about the differences between um, phenoxybenzamine and doxazosin. Um, any implications for um, um, you know for the case you guys did? Um, any implications for intraop anesthesia management? Um, if depending on which alpha blocker you choose? Um, I know that you do want to have the patient stop their alpha blockade the night before, um, but I, I don't know. I, did, I didn't come across if there were specific anesthesia agents that should be avoided or used in the event of alpha blockade. Yeah, so not so much the anesthesia agent, but what they use if the patient becomes hypotensive. And so phenylephrine is an alpha agonist. And so the difference between um, phenoxabenzamine and um, doxazosin is that the, the one is a competitive um, 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 alpha blocker and the other one is non-competitive. And so if you have a non-competitive alpha blocker on board, um, you can give all the phenylephrine you want. You're not necessarily going to overcome it. Um, and so, um, so it may re um, theoretically may may reduce the ability of anesthesia to actually get someone's blood pressure up, um, and then they may have to use alternative um, agents for uh, as vasopressors. So, um, that's one of the reasons why you may favor doxazosin as a, as opposed um, to phenoxybenzamine, uh, because you theoretically can overcome it, um, but that obviously also may make it a less um, beneficial alpha agonist. Um, um, in the periop setting, there there have been trials looking at them, phenoxybenzamine versus um, doxazosin, and, and there's essentially no difference. But it's just something to be aware of. If someone's really well alpha blocked with a non-competitive alpha blocker, um, they may get no benefit from phenylephrine in the operating room. Nice talk, Alex. This is Dinesh thing. The other thing is phenoxybenzamine is a much longer acting, which can be both a good and bad thing. I was just going to say in in uh, uh, approaching adrenal tumors as a uh, plug for approach, um, that the right side is a very nice approach to do retroperitoneally because you, you literally do not touch the adrenal gland uh, before getting the adrenal vein. The adrenal gland is actually up and, and sort of tented up before you take down the attachments and the adrenal vein is already on stretch. So you, it's, it's a it's a very nice and preferred way to approach a right side, particularly the handful that I've done on the right side, I've all done retroperitoneally. We're gonna go on to our next talk. Uh, so uh, today we have uh, Jack Agney, who is a sub-intern with us. Uh, he's from uh, Yale School of Medicine. And we're going to have Jack talk about advances in the surgical management, management of BPH, so. All right. Uh, well, thank you for having me, everyone. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the surgical management of BPH today and more specifically, uh, whole lip and aquablation. Uh, I was drawn to this topic after uh, observing some uh, whole lips in the operating room with Dr. Kellner. Um, so my goals for this talk will be to provide you with some uh, sort of up-to-date safety and efficacy data on these two techniques. Uh, we'll start with a, a background on BPH. Uh, we'll go into the data, and then as we go, I'll update you on some of the uh, recently amended uh, AUA guidelines on the uh, surgical management of BPH as we go. Uh, 
So BPH is a benign proliferation of tissue in the uh, prostatic transition zone uh, that can lead to physical obstruction of the prostatic uh, urethra. It's a multifactorial process with uh, genetic, hormonal, and environmental influences playing a role. Uh, the prevalence uh, does increase with age, with uh, up to 80% of men over 70 having some degree of BPH. The symptoms that we think about can be divided into storage, uh, voiding, and post-voiding symptoms. And these are often, often uh, quantified both in clinical practice um, and in trials with the International Prostate Symptom Score, which divides patients into mild, moderate, uh, and severe uh, in terms of increasing score. So when we think about the, uh, the interventions that we have at our, disposable, at our disposal to treat uh, BPH, it's, uh, it's useful to view these in terms of increasing effectiveness and also invasiveness. So first, of course, we have our medical therapy uh, with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and alpha blockers. And since the advent of, of medical therapy for BPH, there's been a steady decline in uh, the number of surgical procedures performed uh, annually for the procedure. And so as a result, patients who now present for surgery um, are, are generally older, uh, might have more comorbid conditions, um, and, are, and are sometimes further along in the natural history uh, of the disease. Moving up, we have our minimally invasive uh, surgical therapies, two of which are uh, Urolift, uh, which we do here at Yale, and then the, uh, the water vapor-based based Resume. These are great for high-risk individuals who can't tolerate surgery. Um, they're often office-based therapies, and these two uh, give you preservation of ejaculatory function, which is important for some patients. And then finally, we have our quote-unquote definitive therapies, uh, with the gold standard traditionally being TERP. And then we have our newer modalities, uh, which we'll discuss, including HOLEP and aqua ablation. Uh, now, what about our indications for surgery? Uh, there are some scenarios where surgery is indicated as the initial intervention. Uh, classically, uh, these are, and this is according to the AUA guidelines, um, renal insufficiency, refractory urinary retention, uh, recurrent UTIs, uh, bladder stones, and gross hematuria, and then symptoms refractory to other therapies or in patients who are unwilling to, uh, to, to, to use other therapies. Um, so here, this is taken from, this is the algorithm taken from the guidelines published in 2018 and uh, amended in 2019 and 20. And so it gives you an idea of the wide range of options that we have. Uh, what this does, it, it stratifies things by size. Um, so, um, you see that at the average and small prostate level, there's a lot of therapies available. And then uh, once you get up into the large prostates, um, you're looking at prostatectomy uh, and then HOLIP, which we'll discuss next, and FULIP, which is a similar laser nucleation procedure. And then note that uh, the size independent options here are uh, again, HOLIP and FULIP. So we'll start with HOLIP. This was developed in the 1990s by Peter Gilling. It's performed under uh, general anesthesia. It works with a photothermal mechanism, uh, which gives it really good hemostatic properties. Uh, basically, the, the wavelength of the laser is, is um, pretty short and it gets absorbed by water in the tissue, which leads to rapid uh, vaporization. And so this minimizes the depth of penetration of the laser while providing uh, a larger radius of coagulation. Uh, then important to distinguish enucleation from you know, ablation or resection. What we're doing here is we're really separating the adenoma from the prostate capsule along anatomical lines, um, often um, compared to, you know, peeling an orange from the inside. Uh, and it's comparable to a simple prostatectomy in terms of the degree of tissue removal. The enucleated tissue is then uh, pushed into the bladder and uh, where it's morselated. Uh, one advantage of uh, this technique is it's, uh, it's appropriate for all prostate sizes and configurations. Um, and normal saline is used as your irrigation fluid, which of course uh, eliminates the risk of TR syndrome that we see in monopolar TERP. Um, and so when we looked at the AUA guideline algorithm, we saw among the options for larger prostates, uh, we had HOLEP and simple prostatectomy. And so this is a retrospective study comparing um, 600 patients undergoing HOLEP and 32 undergoing robot assisted simple prostatectomy um, at two centers between 2008 and 15. And we see that the advantage in terms of operative time uh, is on HOLEP side, 
as well as other perioperative factors like change in hemoglobin, um, rate of transfusion, uh, length of stay in the hospital, and also catheterization time after surgery. Uh, and that goes back to uh, those hemostatic properties of the laser that we, that we talked about. Uh, interestingly, there were no significant differences in the overall rate of uh, significant complications, but there was a, a death in the, um, the prostatectomy group. Uh, here again, talking about large prostates, um, we have a meta-analysis incorporating three RCTs with 12 to 24 months of follow-up, uh, this time comparing simple prostatectomy and HOLEP, and there were no significant differences in terms of functional outcomes, um, post void residual, urine flow rate, um, IPSS, uh, or quality of life. Uh, the prostatectomy group had shorter operative times and on average had more tissue retrieved. But again, the whole lip group show, had shorter hospitalizations and catheterization time, and then also less blood loss. And there was no difference in the overall complication rates uh, here. So that's large prostates. What about very large prostates? So over 200 cc's. This is a nice series of 88 patients out of uh, Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Um, and they had follow-up times at six and 12 months. The mean prostate volume uh, was 255 with a range of up to 770 cc's. And on the right here, you can see a CT scan of what that looks like. Um, there were three, about 3% 3 of the procedures were ultimately converted to um, prostatectomy. 8% uh, uh, instead of morselating the tissue, they had to manually remove the tissue via cystotomy uh, because the morselation time would, would just be too long. Um, time to discharge and catheterization time a little bit longer than we've seen previously in these larger prostates, uh, but the outcomes in terms of QMAX and IPSS pretty favorable. And then uh, uh, there's Note the 19% uh, the transfusion rate, that's much higher than, than most other studies that I've seen, the ones that I've shown so far. Um, it's a small sample size. The authors noted that, um, that many of the patients who received transfusions were on anticoagulation um, and had cardiac history, thereby lowering uh, the transfusion threshold in these patients. Uh, but this is generally not in line with, with uh, the data on uh, sort of more normal sized prostates that, are, uh, that, that, that I've shown so far. And we'll get into some of the, uh, um, some of the data on anticoagulation in HOLEP. So here I'll take this time to uh, bring in some uh, information from the uh, AUA guidelines, where they say that uh, HOLEP as well as the thulium laser um, are prostate size independent options for the treatment of uh, BPH. Now moving uh, ahead, using that uh, the scaffold of the algorithm uh, from the AUA guidelines, um, we'll move to uh, prostates in the small and intermediate size. Uh, so this is, an, uh, this is a meta-analysis published in 2019 with follow-up times of, again, one to two years, incorporating up to, uh, incorporating 11 RCTs, uh, looking at the efficacy and the safety of hold-up compared to TERP. Uh, and this is in prostates less than 100 grams. Uh, we see that the intraoperative and perioperative factors of blood loss, transfusion rate, et cetera, um, favored HOLEP. The operative times were sh shorter in the uh, TERP group. Um, and then in this meta-analysis, the PVR and QMAX favored HOLEP, although I will say that the data on that that I've seen is mixed. And I think we can at, at the least say that uh, HOLEP is, is comparable to, to TERP if not better on these, on these two outcomes. And then there were no significant differences in IPSS, the symptom score, at one in six months. HOLEP was superior at a year, but then this difference disappeared by two years, uh, which might have been affected by the sample size, which was a bit smaller at the two-year mark. Uh, there are also no significant differences noted on uh, quality of life scores or other adverse uh, events. And so here we bring in another part of the guidelines, which is that HOLEP is among the procedures that should be considered in patients at higher risk of bleeding, um, such as those uh, on anticoagulation. And that's again, due to the generally good hemostatic properties uh, of, the, of, uh, of the holium laser. Uh, this is a um, retrospective study that sought to 
identify um, predictive factors of urinary incontinence, something that's relatively common, at least temporarily after the holdup procedure. Um, over 2,000 patients involved, their incontinence rate at three months post-operatively was 14.5%, uh, but then down to 4.2% at six months. And so looking at factors that predicted whether you'd have incontinence at a certain time point, uh, at three months, we had a nucleation weight. Um, so the size of the prostate plays a, plays a role. Um, and then age as well as BMI. And the, probably the biggest protective factor in this time point was surgeon experience. So this ties into a uh, critique that's often lodged against uh, Holep, which is this idea of the, the steep learning curve. Um, and, uh, but it, 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 it is, it is uh, worthwhile to note that this difference in the incontinence rates based on surgeon experience does uh, sort of disappear by six months where we see diabetes and age and BMI are the main factors. Um, and a lot of work has been done looking at the, this learning curve, whether that's a valid principle. And what I've seen, and this may I'd be interested to hear from Dr. Kellner, but um, the data sort of shows that people can achieve competence in whole that by about 25 to 50 cases. Um, so here we have data looking uh, at longer term outcomes. So this is a big, uh, a big group, a thousand uh, whole eps done uh, between 1998 and 2009 with a long term uh, follow up time up to 10 years. Uh, the mean prostate size of 99. Again, good, uh, good changes in AUA score um, in terms of subjective symptoms. Also, um, Pretty significant increase in the Q max, relatively low rate of complications. And again, you see this temporary stress urinary incontinence at 12.5% at six weeks. But in the long term follow up in this large group, uh, we see that the long term rates of incontinence are 1.4% here. So um, it seems like more of a transient problem. Uh, a similar study, another 1,000 patients. Uh, out of McGill University, um, mean prostate size a little bit smaller, very low transfusion rate. Again, that transient urinary incontinence at 4.9%, but the persistent incontinence is down to again 1.5% over the long term, and the rate of uh, reoperation is less than 1%. Uh, and then at the bottom here, you see that uh, the changes in functional and symptomatic outcomes are durable and they last uh, up to a year and up to 10 years at least in this uh, cohort. Here I'll quickly touch on uh, the feasibility of Holep as a day case. So this group uh, sort of pre-identified patients who could potentially be discharged on the day of the operation. Um, and they sort of looked at which factors determine who gets discharged and who doesn't. Uh, they were able to um, successfully discharge 60% of, of patients. Um, and the main predictive factor for who was discharged was preoperative prostate volume. Um, five of the patients that were discharged, so 17% were ultimately readmitted after that same day discharge. And that tended to be patients with high rates of uh, history of UTI. So basically this shows that um, you know, same day discharge is feasible in some well-selected patients, but uh, more studies are kind of needed to clarify uh, who's, who's eligible for that. And then just lastly, uh, there are case reports of Holep that's, uh, that have been done after Urolift. And uh, Dr. Kellner also has experience with this. Uh, as I saw one of these. Um, the retreatment rate after Urolift, according to the LIFT study, at five years was about uh, just under 14%. And so it's helpful to be able to counsel patients that they can, uh, they can uh, get Holep after failed Urolift. And this group just sort of showed the procedure for that. Uh, here's another piece of the guidelines, uh, just talking about the possibility of treatment failure and how, although these are you know, considered more definitive therapies, there are obviously um, treatment failure rates that are important to keep in mind. And the authors of the guidelines also note that uh, there's traditionally an underreporting of retreatment with medical therapy as an outcome. And so uh, that's something to, to look out for because if you're, if you're doing a surgical procedure to fix BPH, you shouldn't really need additional medication if you're gonna call it a successful treatment. Uh, so our take home points for whole app would be that it's size independent, 
Uh, it's favorable in large prostates compared to prostatectomy, uh, comparable or to or better outcomes than TERP in other size prostates. Durable results up to 10 years, uh, better uh, perioperative outcomes in terms of blood loss and hospital stays, and uh, potentially a day case in well-selected patients. So from there, we'll move on to aquablation, uh, which is an ablation of the prostate uh, using a robotically controlled water jet that's inserted transurethrally. Um, important about the important point about this is that it's uh, image guided in real time with transrectal ultrasound. And so here's your, um, here's your image of, of what that looks like in real time. Uh, this allows for you know, precise mapping of the prostate before and during uh, the procedure. Um, uh, this gives you, this lets you um, sort of precisely map where you're going to resect and allows you to preserve the, um, limit, it, limit the resection in the area of the varimontanum, montanum, which as we see here, here at the bottom is important to, um, to preserve ejaculatory function, which is again, one of the unique aspects of, of aqua ablation. It's also uh, precise and, and pretty rapid in terms of resection times. Here's what the setup looks like. And at the tip of the robotic handpiece, you have a, a very small sapphire nozzle that allows tight control of, of water flow. And that's, that's, that's why this, there's this precise control to the, um, to the therapy. So the water trial, which is the, which is the first uh, you know, randomly con randomized control trial comparing aquablation versus TERP. It was double blind, which is interesting. Uh, and it was a non-inferiority trial in prostates 30 to 80 cc's. They evaluated IPSS and complications at six months, and they found that the non-inferiority hypothesis was satisfied. Uh, the resection time was significantly lower for aquablation, just four minutes um, versus 27 minutes for TERP, although they did have similar total operative time. And the uh, change in hemoglobin was greater in aquablation, but only one transfusion uh, in this group. Um, the, the bleeding risk in aquablation is one of the main criticisms of the procedure, um, which we'll talk about as we go. This is the two-year outcomes after aquablation in that same cohort, the WATER trial, and they show that effic efficacy and ejaculatory improvements uh, were sustained. Um, so again, here they assigned patients in it's sort of a two to one ratio. They had 93% um, of subjects um, at 24 month follow-up, which is impressive. Um, and then again, non-significant differences in uh, change in QMAX and IPSS, uh, but uh, as well as retreatment, although it was a little bit higher in aquablation. And then importantly, the anejaculation rate in aquablation um, is 10% versus 36% in the TERP group. And so here, coming in from the guidelines again, they say that aquablation can be offered uh, to patients with sympt BPH symptoms, provided the prostate volume is between 30 and 80 grams, which, is, which were the limitations of this study. However, they have looked at uh, larger prostates in, with aquablation. This was the WATER2 trial, uh, prospective study in 101 men with larger prostates, 80 to 150. Although this time, no head-to-head -head comparison with TERP. Um, and the two-year results um, for this were recently published in 2020. Um, prostate volume on average 107. Uh, OR time 37, pretty fast for this, uh, this size prostate. Uh, length of stay 1.6 days. Uh, and then if you look over on the right, you see the significant changes that are durable up to two years in terms of subjective factors and functional outcomes. Um, and then looking down at the bottom of the table here, bleeding complications up at 10% and transfusions, you know, higher than we've seen mostly in, in HOLEP at, uh, in this, in this uh, size category um, at 8%. Um, and so, the main ways that you can achieve hemostasis after the ablation with, with the water jet uh, are to provide mild catheter traction with a balloon inflated in the bladder, or you can re-enter with the resectoscope and provide electrocautery. And the authors noted in this that um, some of the strategies to solve this difficulty in the bleeding risk um, 
are the development of novel catheters that uh, can provide simultaneous compression of the bladder, neck, and prostate fossa, and also deliver hemostatic agents. So this data was not incorporated into the AUA guidelines as of 2020. As I mentioned, uh, the guidelines recommend aquablation for 30 to 80 cc's, as there are no randomized control trials really looking at TERP versus aquablation in this size. So further studies are, are, are definitely needed. And then just our take, take home points for aqua ablation. Uh, it's image guided and fast. Um, this image guided nature gives, it's said to have a better learning curve compared to whole lep, it's easier to learn. Um, lower rates of anejaculation compared to TERP, which can be important for some men who are sexually active and uh, potentially effective in, uh, in larger prostates, though more, more data is needed on that front. And the, this bleeding problem um, does still remain a barrier uh, to its widespread acceptance. And here I just have some, uh, some restatement of some of the updated guidelines from the AUA that we've covered. And uh, I think I'll just leave it there. And uh, here are my references. Just to say thank you to, uh, to everyone who made my, uh, my sub eye a really great experience, especially the residents uh, for helping me along. I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, happy to take questions. So, so Jack, this is Dr. Keller. That was a very nice talk. Um, so when you think about whole lip and aquablation, if you were a patient and they were both presented to you, which one would you choose? Uh, is, there, is there one that you think would be better than the other? Um, I think uh, it would be, you know, one, one thing to consider is, is just surgeon experience with, um, with one versus the other. Um, and it would also sort of depend on the, the dimensions of, of, you know, of the individual prostate. Uh, so for in, in larger, in those larger prostates, um, you know, whole lip would, would definitely be favored. Um, as far as other individual patient characteristics, um, there is the anejaculation uh, issue. And so if I'm someone who wants to preserve my ejaculatory function, um, that is, you know, more likely to, to occur in, in, uh, in the aqua ablation group. Um, so overall, I think it sort of depends and, you know, it should go on sort of a case by case basis um, with sort of a shared decision making uh, based on the patient characteristics. Yeah. So, so, is, that, is that Harris? Yeah, yeah. I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, great. Yeah. Um, one, uh, just for the residents, uh, the guidelines suggest that you do um, incorporate some type of imaging and or cystoscopy to assess prostate size. Because as you can see, um, many of these uh, treatments are uh, size uh, independent. Uh, a, a question vis-a-vis, -vis, and this could either be for Jack or um, for Kellner, is vis-a-vis -vis the um, uh, uh, whole up, why do you think there's such a high rate of early stress incontinence? compared to TERP after HOLEP? So, yeah, so I, I, I've obviously put a lot of thought into that because the biggest uh, thing that would upset patients after surgery is, is dealing with incontinence. Um, I've definitely seen less incontinence as I've progressed with uh, my learning curve. Um, one of the things that I've done and I've adopted is, is something called early apical release. And that's where I focus on releasing the adenoma at the apex from the sphincter. Um, I do that as the beginning of the procedure. And I'm making sure that I'm adequately, um, you know, re releasing the sphincter versus a lot of the other surgeons when I first learned it is they release the sphincter at the end of the case. Um, by re releasing it early, you're basically not putting traction on the sphincter the entire case. So I, I am seeing earlier return of continents with this early, early apical release of, this, of the prostate. So I think a lot of it is technical. Um, I think some of it is that if you're disrupt, disrupting the mucosa in that area, it takes time for it to heal. Um, it is kind of scary when you're first doing these procedures and you see uh, incontinence and you, and you try to be reassuring to patients, but you're basing your reassurance on data that you've read, but not your own experience. Um, so I definitely was nervous at first when patients were incontinence and wondering if they're ever going to get better. But I saw the vast majority of patients did get better. Um, I think I have one person out of over 100 people uh, that had quite a bit of leaking. And, and I think you saw him, Harris. You were thinking about doing a sling to him. Um, in my own observation, the patients who have terrible, terrible urgency 
prior to surgery tend to have more problems afterwards. So I think you, you know, you've opened up the prostate, patients are urinating better, the obstructive symptoms are resolved, uh, but the bladder doesn't know to, to calm down right away. And it just takes, it takes time for things to start to, to relax. So I, I've seen urgency associated with incontinence as a bigger issue than stress incontinence with this procedure. Um, when I look at these two procedures, aquablation and HOLEP, I think the, the thing that really just maybe stands out is aquablation seems to preserve uh, ejaculatory function um, better than HOLEP. Uh, with HOLEP, it's, it's almost 100% uh, retrograde ejaculation. In the literature, it says 75%. Uh, interestingly enough, I do have some patients who could still ejaculate after HOLEP, so it, it's, it's not absolute. Um, here, she's the only one I know who has actually done aquablation. I mean, are you impressed by the procedure? Hey, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying impressed. I mean, we've done a handful. We have a couple uh, set up, I think, later this month at the VA. Um, it's a little labor intensive to uh, set up. Um, I agree the resection time is very short. And we've done a couple of large prostates, and you have to run the, uh, um, the, the aqua ablation procedure twice and adjust the depths. I will say, however, we, uh, in the hand, again, this is all anecdotal. We've had uh, 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 pretty good results in terms of symptomatic relief and uh, preservation of anti-grade ejaculation. So if anti-grade ejaculation is a, is, if preservation of that is, um, is important to the patient, then I, I think that's clearly where the uh, aqua ablation has an advantage. Now the disadvantage is, as what Jack mentioned, um, mm -hmm. you know, this whole business about stopping bleeding afterwards can be challenging. They, they, they've morphed over time from, um, Using a using traction and a special uh, catheter uh, uh, contraption. Bottom line is you have, you've got to, at least in my experience you've got to go back in and cauterize. Uh, they they tell you to spot cauterize so you don't affect the ejaculation. But so so far so good. But uh, we'll see. We've we've got a few more scheduled. Yeah, and so the only last comment I say about the whole up is it, it is a very hemostatic procedure, um, and I've been trying to send. A, uh, my patients home actually uh, this week uh, I was I had a trifecta I had three patients who had whole left they all went home the same day um, and so I think that's what we're moving towards um, is I think the majority of patients can go home um, I think the biggest predictor for me is if they go home or not is what time of day their surgery is if their surgery is in the morning I think there's a good chance they're going to go home if it's a later in the later in the afternoon just there's just not enough time in the day to observe them in their recovery room and they're more likely to stay overnight and my, my patients have their catheters removed the next day. Um, so um, a little bit of extra time in the OR is beneficial for the patient. Uh, well, they'll have less time in the hospital. So are there any other questions at all? So, all right, that was a great talk, Jack. It was great, great having you. Good luck with uh, the match. Thanks, everyone.